Cool. So Stephen Bernard here with Nick Maglio. Uh, Nick is a loan officer that's been helping my team uh, for a, a while and helped me with my very first deal in real estate. Uh, so thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Nick. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, funny story. This is actually the first time we get to see each other's faces live. Uh, you know, cutting your teeth in real estate in the in the year of COVID, you learn how to do everything remote. So it's good to actually do that as well. Yeah, nice um, to meet you. Bye. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I figure we start with an introduction. So tell me about yourself uh, and, you know, anyone that watches this about yourself, how long you've been in the business, what got you in it, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I've been, um, I went to the University of San Diego, graduated in 2003. And um, while I was, when I was graduating, my, uh, my parents actually were getting a property downtown San Diego at a new development. And uh, we're talking to the, the preferred lender that was on the project for, for Boza was the developer and uh, asking if there's any opportunity for kind of real estate careers, et cetera. And so they linked me up with um, a gal by the name of Lisa um, went down to interviewed with her and ended up kind of joining her team in terms of doing all the new construction condo financing. Uh, so a lot of the new buildings in downtown San Diego that were, that were being built were being built in 2002 to 2005. Um, so we did a lot of the, the financing for the for the builders down there. So that's how I launched into the business. Um, so I started started in 2003, um, been in the business since, haven't left at all and taken any hiatuses, kind of market turns. So I've been been in this doing it during, you know, tougher times versus, um, you know, when documentation went from stated income loans to full doc loans, I've kind of seen the full gamut of changes in our business. Um, so now fast forward now, I'm, you know, I've been, I'm at cross country, uh, mortgage which is uh i've got an office in utc in san diego and got a great team around me that i've been working with for several years now um you know majority of our my business has been developed through real estate agents and builders that's kind of the footprint i've followed just in terms of how i started with builders to kind of you know the, the backbone of our business is really real estate agent referrals um and so that's kind of where we're at so we're kind of a boutique high customer service, high touch point. That's kind of how we run our business, being able to close fast, offer good terms and kind of being efficient in terms of timeliness of being able to do 10 day closes, 14 day closes that others can't just because of our, the team approach to it um, and the more boutique feel. So we've so been doing it a long time, seen, you know, seen a lot of changes obviously over the years and you're, you know, being that you're somewhat newer, right? You're kind of in a a, a part of the cycle right now that I think is favorable, you know, to be in the market r rather than there's going to be a lot of change and, and there's going to be a lot of opportunity because of what's going on in the market. So I think it's actually a, a good time to be in the market as a lender or real estate agent because there's going to be change that happens where some exit the business and then people that figure out how to navigate the next cycle of the market are going to be able to position their clients to, to favor, you know, get favorable results over the long term. And you know, that's, that's the best way to put it. I think that's one of the biggest reasons for having that conversation is like having that knowledge to be able to navigate what everyone can see is coming um, will set up, you know, the consumer up for success. So I think that's the biggest value in, in you sharing your experience because you've seen market turns. You've seen the biggest market turn in, or real estate market turn in, in our generation, you know, um, as, a, as a professional in the industry and not many... Uh, of those active today can say that same thing. You know, you hear about the real estate millionaire between 2010 yeah. and 2018. Uh, you know, if you weren't making a million bucks and you were putting all your money into real estate, you know, I wouldn't take any sort of advice from you. Um, <laughs> uh, but you and again, there's been some good times, bad times, but I think seeing most of the people that made their money were in a higher interest rate environment, me personally, in terms of my real estate holdings, the ones that I'm making money on, I bought in a higher interest rate environment rather than a lower interest rate environment, um, which I will do again. I mean, that's kind of going to be my strategy is as rates go up and it weeds out buyers, I'm going to go ahead and enter the market again when there's less competition, get better pricing on the property, and then refinance it out later when rates come back down. That's it. You heard it right there. Make money in a high interest rate market by identifying the deal. You make your money on the purchase. 
uh, just said this in a piece of content I put out, you know, Warren Buffett, nobody in the right mind tries to time a, a market. We know it'll go through cycles, right? And you're doing right. it. You're doing it for, we, I've read it in a book. Um, so it's so valuable to, to hear it from you, Nick. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, you're absolutely right. You make money on your buy. So it's, uh, and the time will, it's coming, right? There's, it's already changing and they're receiving less offers, which, you know, equates to a better price point for the buyer, which is, you know, who we're working with, obviously, doing loans. So that's uh, encouraging to see. Cool. So, yeah, I think that's a great segue uh, into the first part of the discussion here, um, where the goal is to kind of talk about different products available that, you know, the tools in the toolbox that people have as the market shifts. Um, you know, the, the right and what, wrong way to go about getting them, you know, things to set them up for success and then turn it into, you know, the context, what's going on today. So uh, let's jump right in. Uh, we have a few different kinds of buyers in the market, right? You have a first time home buyer, you have an investor and here in San Diego, you have plenty of people that just want to buy a second home to vacation in, not put it on Airbnb or try and cash flow invest any sort of way. Um, can you kind of talk about different loan products um, for each of those types of buyers and which one may be best to serve them? Yeah, so, so for first time home buyers, you know, we'll start with that. You have, you know, products that range from, you know, conventional loans, which will go as low as 3% down. And then there's also down payment assistance programs that can assist with down payment if qualified to, you know, first time home buyer being an FHA loan that's three and a half percent down. Um, those are primarily the two products used. So you'll, you know, traditionally a 30 year fixed mortgage, um, you know, in terms of down payment assistance right now is very difficult because, you know, a lot of the qualifications to be eligible for down payment assistance require you can't make a certain over a certain threshold of income to be eligible for down payment assistance, but the price points of properties require income higher than the threshold for down payment assistance to get down payment assistance. So that's kind of right now on pause, I would say, based on where rates are and where, you know, the price of properties are, but um, there's still ways to get in with, you know, just the three to 5% down conventional loans and then three and a half percent FHA loans, which we're using, you know, every day in terms of getting people on properties. Um, in terms of, um, you know, like there's then the next segment I would call would be like the move up buyer, which is like, you know, someone moved having has a current property and needs to either sell to buy or they're going to turn their current property into a rental and then buy. Um, we see a lot of that. That's probably about 75% of the buyers that we're working with right now are, are moving a lot of them from the Bay Area down to San Diego, where they'll have a property in the Bay Area that they are going to sell or before they buy or they're going to, they're going to sell after they close that's from their new house. Um, you know, for those types of buyers, there's there's bridge loan options that get some equity out of the current property because they need to get that equity out for the down payment. So we use a lot of bridge products to get that equity extracted and used for the new purchase. And then um, you know, for clients that already have cash on hand, then we can just do a new loan and they can sell after the fact. Um, but again, that's going to also change where, you, you know, offers may be able to be taken where there is a contingency sell property one to get property two at some point, but it's been so competitive up until this point that you've had to use creative options, which is like the bridge loan, et cetera, and not be contingent, but that also could change as, as the market changes. Can you unpack that a little bit more about the bridge loan? Yeah, so the bridge loan basically, essentially what it does is, uh, I'll give an example, someone that owns a property that they're gonna sell that's worth 2 million. For example, they owe a million, right? So there's a million in equity and they wanna go buy a property, for example, at 2.5 million for the, pro the second leg of the purchase. Um, and they don't want to have to be able to sell to buy, right? To get that equity, the bridge loan of basically would take out a 500,000 in equity of the property they own now to be able to use for the down payment without having to sell. Wow. So, so that way you're, you're not a contingent offer on the sale. So you're, you're almost tapping into equity that way, like you would be in a HELOC. That's correct. It's like a HELOC, but it's so my recommendation for anyone out is, to take a HELOC on a property, if they have any thought of selling and wanting to buy in the future, put the HELOC on the put a HELOC on your property now. Don't wait until you find the dream house 
to get a bridge loan because a HELOC is much cheaper than a bridge loan. Oh, wow. Because it, a bridge loan is tied to the both properties, the one they're selling and buying, and the lender knows they're not going to have the loan very long because they're going to put the le- loan on it. It's going to be paid off very fast. A HELOC is just the home equity line of credit. So you could put it on today, not use it for six months, find a dream home. It's there. Write yourself a check for the down payment. And, it, and there, it, there's not the excessive rate and fees. Wow. So great. Creative financing uh, 101 uh, right there. So, you know, you said a couple of things already, one, uh, one of which I kind of want to circle back to when you were talking about your, your first time home buyer, three to 5% conventional loans, three to 5% down payment. Uh, everyone that has or can get cold feet thinks 20%, 20% is the magic number. Nationwide, the average is what, 12% for a down payment? And you're talking right. about, yeah, you're talking about conventional products, not even the specialty programs uh, that have that range. And then moving forward, when you're looking for that move up and you're like, oh, but I have a house, um, I do want to move up, but rates are getting greater. Maybe I don't have the liquid cash for a down payment. You're saying, one, there's a loan product for that, but two, there's a more creative way to go about it where you HELOC yourself for your down payment um, and, exactly. and get into your next property. Um, exactly. Which, uh, you know, the investor world's all about, but I feel like that information is kind of within the sphere of people that, you know, whereas everyone could take advantage of that information. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Awesome. And uh, so what about investor products? Now, can an investor buy a second, third, fourth, fifth home taking advantage of three to 5% down? No. So in a true investment property loan, traditionally, you're going to look at anything from 20% to depending on the price point and the property type in terms of single family versus like a two to four unit, it could be anywhere from 20 to 30% down required. Um, you know, invest investment property loans are, are there's there's more options in terms of the qualification. So you can do anything from a full doc, you use your employment and the rental income to qualify from the subject property, or you know, there's now pro, there's a lot of products out there that do a debt service coverage ratio, which just takes what the the monthly rents are of the property, and as long as they're greater than the housing payment, including the mortgage interest taxes and insurance, you can get a loan based on the debt service coverage ratio of the property, uh, which make it so we don't look at other income for the debt to income ratio of qualification. So, so those are popular, right? Because if the property self sustains in terms of the cash flow, you can get a loan, you know, based just on the property itself if you don't have employment and income. And what's the down payment typically with that? You said 20 to 30 percent? 20 percent, 20 percent plus. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, but that said, for someone that's looking to, to buy in San Diego as an investment, is a real estate investor, owns multiple units somewhere else, has, a trouble, has trouble qualifying for your traditional mortgage um, because they don't show the W-2 that everybody else would show, um, that's a viable option if you run the numbers and the numbers for work. Sure. For sure. Cool. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do of people that use it. It's more of a multifamily commercial type loan product that's in the uh, residential space now for, for rentals. Right, right. Um, how small is that multifamily um, that you're seeing those products go for? In terms of the loan size? No, no. Is a, and in terms of units, are we talking small, small oh, multifamily, I, like two units? Any, well, this can go from two to four units mm-hmm. for the, and then above four units of five units up is a true multifamily loan or anything up to four units is residential. Right. Okay. Got it. Cool. Important distinction. Yep. Um, so fixed rate versus arm. Uh, Dave Ramsey, uh, everyone that bought a house in 2007 that didn't know what they were doing and sold it in 2009, um, or couldn't afford it through unfortunate circumstance. Um, they tell their, the younger generation buying homes right now buy a fixed rate loan, always buy a fixed rate loan. Um, but there's another um, way to go about the interest rate on a mortgage product, you know, with uh, an adjustable rate. Is that ever a right move for someone? So it can be. 
for sure. Um, it depends on what the spread between a fixed rate product and an adjustable rate product is in terms of the French. Um, it, it, it's definitely, and I have a 10 one arm, like it's, so it's ten, fixed for 10 years and adjust once a year. I have my property, um, a resident, so I, I'm a believer in the product. Um, you just have to see the benefit of what you're saving over that first 10 years and know the risk of what happens if you still have that loan in, on year 11, in my example, right? Um, if you don't, if there's, if, if you weigh the benefit down, for, for example, there's no chance you're going to own the property year 11. So why do you care if it goes past that? And what's, if the, if the rate's never going to adjust after 10, the 10th year, it can be a good product. Um, but you have to understand the risk of what happens when the rate adjusts. Um, but there are a lot of benefits to adjustable rate mortgages in terms of the savings over that first 10 years. You know, if they're spread on the, the rate between that and that 30 year fixed, it can save you a couple hundred grand on a big loan. Yeah. So, so again, they're coming back for the last couple of years. You, there was really no need to look at adjustable rate mortgages given how low fixed rate mortgages are. Um, but as fixed rate mortgages go up and the adjustable rate mortgages because of the yield spread on, you know, the different, the, the two five seven versus ten year as those yield spreads change, an adjustable rate mortgage gap between that and the thirty year become greater. The adjustable rate mortgages will come back. Yeah, so that's a viable tool for people to be conscious of going forward. You know, it, it's some, it's definitely something to look into because it helps with the affordability. Right, but as with all you know purchases, you know, as all investments go, you have to understand the risk that you take and what your hedge Correct. is against that risk. You know, right. you're you're counting on. Uh, being able to go through a either a complete turn of the market, you know, you're going through a down cycle where the uh, adjustable rate is better than your fixed rate, and then you see a trend where rates are cut again. Um, so you're taking that bet, or you're counting on the appreciation play. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Um, how about loan products that people may not know about? Um, and we've already talked. To, uh, about a few of them, like the bridge loan, but products that people don't know about, don't take advantage of that you think everyone should say, hey, baseline, this is this is what you have available to use. This is what you can't use. You know, I think, um, you know, in terms of a lot of people know, like if you're, you know, from military, you know, veterans, active duty, the VA loan is a great loan, you know, first time home buyers really Kind of geared towards FHA conventional low down payment, you know, traditionally that people think. Um, you know, there's a lot of other loan products, kind of like the debt service coverage ratio for investors that people may not know exist in the residential space. And then, you know, for self-employed borrowers, the, which is, you know, always the challenge for them is to, traditionally is how much they show after write-offs on their tax return, right? In gross receipts versus net income. Um, so in terms of that space, I think. You know, there's there's a lot of programs available. Bank statement loans that use the, the the deposits over the 12 or 24 month period to qualify on a business account versus the tax returns. Um, so there's a lot of non-QM loans are called that allow alternative methods of qualifying, and, and that's really helping out a lot of the self-employed borrowers. Um, so those, that's something that you know I think as the market changes, you know. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot more activity in that space, and that space is like projected to grow quite a bit. Um, especially as you're looking at what's happened to a lot of businesses over the last two years in terms of how they're filing their business tax returns. You know, if you're self-employed, there may have been a rough part of the, you know, COVID and you know dips in business, depending on what sector of the economy you're in. Um, you know, so these other type of programs are an alternative way, other than using tax returns, to qualify. I think that's probably the most underlooked and underused part of the market. And there's just a lot of self-employed borrowers that can take advantage of it. And we have a big movement in society by and large right now towards self-employment. You know, they, what, what are they calling it? The great resignation. Uh, great, great. Yep. Everyone's uh, hanging up their business jackets and going on their own adventure, you know, part because technology can afford it, or maybe, you know, they're still working with the company, but working at home. Um, and uh, that's that's super important too to know uh, that's you know whenever something comes up a big decision in life comes up people can overthink it uh, they can see the obstacles before they can see the solutions uh, one of them we already talked about hey you should consider buying a house 
uh, I don't have 20% for a down payment. Well, you don't need that. You know, there are pathways for it. Uh, hey, maybe you should consider buying a house or real estate as an investment for you to build generational wealth. Uh, yeah, but I work for myself and I don't think I'd qualify. Well, actually, you know, with bank statement loans and bank statement products, you might be able to find a pathway for you. So that's a, that's awesome. Um, yeah, no, and that's the other piece is the, um, you know, in terms of like from a self-employed standpoint, right? Like not paying the taxes, you write it all off, maybe leaves you some more cash for down payment because you're not paying it to the IRS and the state for, for taxes, right? So their interest rate may be a little bit higher to do the type of program that's not backed by a bank or a QM loan, they're called. But based on how much you're saving over here by not having to claim all that income, right? I mean, you, you see it actually pencils out in terms of being a business owner and the benefit of being a business owner doesn't prohibit you from buying. It's just got to use a different method to get into the market. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Great toolbox you kind of put together. Um, any pitfalls for investors, first time home buyers, maybe uh, what, what you call uh, move up buyers, um, you know, things they weren't ready for, for the mortgage process and things just fall through because of it. In terms of like getting, you know, getting a mortgage, I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, the earlier you can have a lender look at the file and the documents and the income docs, the assets, the credit, especially the earlier in the process, you can do that, whether even if it's six months before you want to buy, the longer it gives you to change and fix things. Um, I think a lot of, you know, home buyers want to wait until they find the perfect property a lot of times to, to start that process. And, and sometimes it doesn't allow you enough time to fix certain things or, or give advice on certain things to get them in a spot where they can actually get that loan um, because there are a lot of guidelines to getting a loan and different requirements. So the, my biggest advice would be to have someone look at the file sooner than later to give you any recommendations to fix, you know, pay off something on credit or, you know, check on something that's reporting on credit that's an error because some of those things can take time. Um, and then, you know, looking at all the income docs and whatnot and even telling you, hey, if you're self-employed, maybe do this a little differently, talk to your CPA and that might help you in terms of qualifying or not giving advice on how to file the taxes, but to kind of give them like a roadmap of what they would need to show for income to qualify for what they want so that they can make a decision with their CPA etc. just to do things maybe differently than they were. So I think the time is, time is the biggest thing. A lot of things take a little bit of time. So the sooner, the better. And uh, that's such an amazing service. You know, you provide a pathway to someone's end goal that must cost them a lot of money to do, right? Great. It's all free. Totally free. Approvals free. Are free. Free approvals are free. So that's the other thing. I mean, when, when you, I, mean, I can't speak to all, for all lenders, some might charge like an application fee. I can only imagine it's nominal, right? For a credit report, minimal things. But but the process to get pre-approved, at least for how my, myself and my team work, it's there's no cost to get pre-approved. So it's just a free look at what you qualify for today. It's a snapshot of today's credit report, today's income, today's assets, what you can get now. And then if it's not where you want to be, then giving a kind of a forecast credit simulators that can be run to show, hey, get the, do this to get the credit score here, which gets you a better interest rate. There's a lot of tools that we have that we can use to, to, to get people to their goal. And that's something your team does phenomenally well. Um, obviously, whenever I get a, a client, the first thing they do is uh, contact Nick. And if they're not quite there yet, Nick's team will not just drop them and say, next in line, please, Nick's team will break it down, say exactly, you know, X, Y, Z will get you to where you want to be. Um, and, you know, time and again, I say it's the team around you that will deliver you the investment that you that you want or you achieve the best success. And, uh, you know, being right here with Nick and seeing or hearing that information, I think displays that. For sure. Yeah, there, there's clients that we've worked with that we started with two three four years ago that we still you know my team still works with to get them you know into a property and you know some of the I, we had one client we worked with for six years that finally and they got into a property last year so i mean it, there's no duration how long that may take right and it, was, it took a little bit but they ended up getting to their goal of owning so so it's not a it doesn't work today let's be done with it i mean the goal is to get everyone you know into a house if they want to be sure sure um, 
so that's a that's a cool dynamic i i kind of want to touch on off script off script um how the how the process goes right um uh, a realtor and a lender that work closely together i think is a valuable asset to a client um and when i get to meet with the client and help identify their needs and identify the current market um evaluate what's going on and what'll what'll work for them um that's an initial consultation, uh, right away, they turn around and they talk to Nick. Um, and Nick will go through everything and essentially anchor our, our vision, our dream in a reality. And that way, Nick and I can go back and forth with the clients to say, hey, this is what we have going on. This is what we need to do to fill our fiduciary responsibilities to this individual. Um, so, um, I don't think often clients see the realtor lender team working close in tandem. And a lot of that goes on behind the scenes. For sure. I mean, I, I mean, I think a big part of it is having relationships so that the lender and the real estate partner can go through the goals, make sure both are on the same page so that there, there's a common goal for the client that we're both trying to achieve, um, whether it's buying a property in a specific part of town that meets a specific payment or better bathroom count that comes with a certain price that comes with it, right? All that comes into play to make sure we're all going to the same targeted goal. Uh, and I think, you know, some real estate agents don't have a lender partner at all. They just let clients use whatever, you know, bank or whatever it is, which, you know, isn't a bad thing, but if everyone's not on the same page, like you have to work as a team with, you know, CPAs and there's a lot of people that can be involved, 1031 exchange accommodators, right? Where you have a kind of a team around you of professionals that can get you to that end goal, you're going to get a better result typically. So I think like having that real estate agent with the lender partner and any other professionals are needed, it's going to kind of get you the, the results that are needed. Absolutely. Um, and that's a, that's a great segue into uh, kind of things you want the new home buyer to know about the loan process. You already gave a uh, you know, a, a tidbit that it's a day one thing, you know, once the thought comes into your head, it costs you nothing, pursue the pre-approval and start grounding that vision, almost step one. Um, you touched on the documents, you know, just current day pay stubs, uh, maybe there's different products for you that will require different documentation. Um, then what happens? So, so in terms of, yeah, so what, what, so the process will entail like an application. At that point, the application, once we review it with any documentation, pay stubs, W-2s, tax returns, right? We always start with looking at a file like with as a full documentation file, we'll call it, which is like, you know, just a normal kind of bank type product, a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you know, standard loan product. So we'll start there um, go over the, my team goes over goals for the client. What kind of payment do you want? What kind of property do you want? What type of down payment do you want to use? you know, house, condo, town, home, two to four unit, understanding all the, met, like what, what their end goal is, we, we have to start with, because if we don't have that, we don't know what we're backing into in terms of achieving that goal. Um, you know, so once the, once the credit reports reviewed, the documentation's reviewed, the income's extrapolated from the documents, right? We come up with what the max pre-approval figures are, you know, based on the debt to income ratio and, and uh, other factors. Um, if it doesn't get to the goals that we kind of went over with the client, then we'll look at like alternative products if they're available, right? Like pivoting to a different type of loan, a bank statement loan or, you know, 1099 loan for self-employed or a debt service coverage ratio for an investor. There's a lot of other products that we'll use as like our secondary tool, right? And then again, if, and if we can't find anything there, we'll take it one step further going back to the full documentation loan to say, okay, this is what you need to do to be prepared. It might take you six months or nine months or a year, but at least now you have a roadmap to get there. Absolutely. Um, do you do interest rate locks? Is that valuable to clients? We can, yeah. So we can do a lock and shop product where it locks the rate up to 120 days while they're shopping for a, a property. Um, we have locks up, to, like for new construction projects, we can do one year rate locks while a project's being built you know, with a new builder that then comes with like a float down, which allows you to drop rates at closing if they're lower. Um, those require upfront deposits for the most part. Um, those require upfront deposits for the most part, though, in terms of like locking in a long-term rate so that you don't just cancel after it because the lender's paying for that hedge on the lock. Right. Um, 
it's so de depending on the rate market environment, those can be beneficial, right? Um, the risk, there's also risk of if you don't close escrow on your property with 120 days and you've locked in that rate locks you now gone and you're out the deposit potentially, if your house is being built and the 180 day or 360 day rate lock expires because they have construction delays, the property's not done so you can't move in, right? Now, you, now you're paying for extension fees on that lock. Mm. So it's a lot of timing and, and kind of feeling out the market, knowing kind of what's available in terms of like inventory for clients, which is how we work with the realtor. Do you think you're going to be able to find them something to make sure you close escrow within that 120 day, you know, lock and shop. If you don't, let's not do that. Let's not make sure, let's make sure the client doesn't lose it a positive. Yeah. Again, that, that back channel, um, you know, directly talking to professionals that understand the goals and share the vision with the client. Correct. 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 Um, so if you were talking to a brand new buyer today, May 12th, uh, thinking the thought just crossed their head um, that they want to buy a, a single family home in San, San Diego County. What would you give them as far as advice goes? You know, I, I, I tell every buyer, you know, the, the biggest first thing in any market is figure out what your budget is, not what we qualify, not what the lender qualifies you for, right? So a lender may qualify you for, for example, a $5,000 housing payment. You may not want to spend five thousand dollars right so understanding where how much you want to spend on food and going to the movies or whatever other items you have to spend per month is that you know lenders don't when they look at the debt income ratio calculation we don't look at your other spending that we don't see on the credit report so again i think biggest first step i think for people is really defining what they want their housing budget to be you know, and then looking at what their tax savings is with a CPA to see if I buy a property with a $3,500 housing payment, how much does, do I get to save on my federal and state taxes in terms of the interest deduction and the property tax deduction that gets me more out of my paycheck, right? Because that makes it cheaper because you're getting some deductions you wouldn't have had as a renter. I think that's step one. Um, because that will then kind of dictate what that max price is in, in the event that they're qualified for more than they want to actually spend so that they're not on an, like a search for properties that they don't ultimately want to buy. Um, I think that's, I would say five out of 10, when you ask that question, they don't know when, on the first call what they want to spend, which, you know, I think that's, it's not a bad thing. I think that's, but that's how we kind of, kind of direct them into, okay, well, you don't want to pay on something for 30 years that you're not comfortable with that we're saying you call we're telling you you're qualified but you don't need to necessarily spend that because you're going to be paying on it not us yeah that's uh that's invaluable um because at the end of the day we can advise we're advisors you know we can uh we can provide you with the product we can uh talk to you about pros and cons all day but the it's the client's decision at the end of the day but we need to make sure we do our our duty uh, to to deliver them their vision. Um, for sure. Yeah, that's great advice, Nick. So a uh, little more personal. Thank you for talking about loans, loan products, um, and a lot of information that um, individuals, um, you know, wouldn't think about, myself included, you know, down payment three to 5%, bridge loans on residential properties, debt service coverage loans. Uh, bank statement loan products for the self-employed person um, and that great piece of advice hey step one um, personal finance you know define what your monthly is and get pre-approved because it's free um, and find the team that'll deliver it for you um, wrapping that part up let's talk about san diego greatest city in the world where's your favorite place to eat around here you know i um I like Eddie V's in La Jolla. That's just one of our my favorite spots. Just looks over the, the La Jolla Cove, which is cool. Um, probably my go-to spot. You know, when it's a beautiful day, that's that's one of my favorites. And then, you know, downtown there's a or you know there's a sea level and island prime over off uh, I think it's Shelter Island area, mm. which is kind of looking sounds another favorite. Nice. So you're you're one that loves to dine with the view. I like the I like the the water for sure. Oh, uh, so the wife must love the date nights. How about your favorite yeah, for sure. <laughs> favorite place to uh, grab a drink? 
Um, well, you know, Javier's in La Jolla, or you can see it's fun. That's a spot. And then um, downtown in Little Italy, there's a place called Barbusa. That's a, that's a great spot as well. Oh, that's an amazing spot. So check it out. I'm always going to ask these recommendations because San Diego is filled with every kind of culture, every kind of cuisine, every so type of feel. So I feel like everybody's going to have different answers. So thanks, Nick, for that. What about your favorite recreational activity before kids, maybe new father, uh, Nick, congratulations again on that, um, that you like to do and who did you like to do it with? Um, you know, I, I, I enjoy golfing. I, um, golfing something I was doing quite a bit. I, uh, before having kids, uh, I would play every Saturday typically with the same group of guys, which was always a good time. So that was, you know, buddies, of, you know, every Saturday at 7 a.m. for several years. I'll hopefully get back into that, but that's been my uh, kind of my go to uh, kind of activity. Cool. Well, that's awesome, Nick. Hope you get back to it again. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're a 15 year legend in the industry. Uh, plus now uh, and uh, your your insight your advice has been incredible thank you for having me yeah and uh, what's the best way for people to uh, find you Nick yeah you know um, my cell phone is always the best way um, eight, I can kind of give you the number 858-220-4193 um, and then uh, website for our, our team is uh, www.sdlendingteam.com. There you go. There you have it. Go ahead and search out Nick Maglio, one of the best. Thank you so much.